If this goes on, don't panic. Bringing hope to the world through speculative fiction. Welcome to If This Goes On, Don't Panic. In this episode, we have author and community organizer Maurice Brodus. Kat, how are things going? They are going so well. It is spring here, and I've been working in the garden, and it is just delightful. Fantastic. Fantastic. I love it. I know the weather here has been great, too. Kids are loving it. I'm loving them not being in the house all the time. So things are doing well as well. One thing I want to bring up really quick, because we have to do a short intro and a short outro today is that we have a new producer. Uh, His name is Ken Schrader, and I just want to give a shout out to him. He's been working with us on a couple episodes at this point, and he's doing a fantastic job. And I just want to say thanks to him and welcome aboard. Ken's a good guy. I think that should be really good for us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. He seems right in tune with everything we're doing. I love it. I love it. You know, it's always scary when you put stuff out there into the world, into into the internet world, and you're just like, I don't know what's going to come back at me. It could be good. It could be trolls. Who knows? (laughs) There is no telling. (laughs) Absolutely none. So, all right, let's take our quick break right now. And when we come back, we'll have Maurice Brodus with us. Yay. Okay, we're back. Today we have Maurice Brodus, uh, an accidental teacher at the Oaks Academy Middle School and accidental librarian at the school library manager which is part of the NDPL shared system and a purposeful community organizer. There he is the resident Afrofuturist at the Kepra Institute. His work has appeared in Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, Lightspeed Magazine, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Asimov's, and Uncanny Magazine, with some of his stories having been collected in The Voices of Martyrs. His novels include the urban fantasy trilogy The Knights of Breton Court, the steampunk novel Pit My Airship, and the middle grade detective novel series, The Usual Suspects. As an editor, he's worked on Dark Faith, Fireside Magazine, and Apex Magazine. His gaming work includes writing for the Marvel superheroes, Leverage, and Firefly role-playing games, as well as working as a consultant on Watch Dogs 2. Learn more about him at mauricebrodus.com. That's M-A-U-R-I-C-E-B-R-O-A-D-D-U-S.com. Welcome, Maurice. Hello, glad to be here. I was just thinking it might have been a shorter intro if you just said, Maurice does everything cool. <laughs> Look, I was just listening to that going, man, I'm exhausted I'm just hearing all that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not too long ago, I was I was saying to our other co-host, Diane, that uh, writers are like the busiest people in the world. You, yeah. you all do everything. Yeah, it keeps us busy. <laughs> You know, I got to wonder how you all manage it. It's just, it's just crazy. I actually get that question quite a bit, and I think part of it's just the the uh, intentional way I've kind of stacked my life, as it as it were. Mm-hmm. I start by, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, and, and I set, I center that first, and then I bring my family on board as, as my team. They're they're part of that business infrastructure, as it was for uh, <laughs> for for me as a writer, and, and that's just the way it's been for a while. You know, with my, like my wife, for example, she uh, she's my uh, de facto business manager because. I'm just in it for the the writing, for the the, the creative challenge. But, yeah. you know, someone has to be about the, the business of right. it. And so she's just like, oh, I'm, I'm going to make sure the money's coming in and, and all that kind of stuff. And then my sons, for example, they are my uh, quote unquote personal assistants. Mm-hmm. So when I go out to conventions, I usually have one of them with me. Yeah. But then also it's just that buy-in even before, you know, my career really started to take off. It's that, that family buy-in that says, hey. Uh, your dad writes, and so we need we will be creating this environment where you know th- we allow him that time to write. So, for example, you know, it'd be like, "Hey, dad, uh, your father needs some time to write. Let's all go have an adventure." Mm-hmm. So they'll all come, go off, have an adventure, and then when they come back, well, now it's dedicated family time. So now we all can be a family together. And then every job I've taken on ever since is, has to work around that. So it, it allows me to do a lot of things, but it all kind of keeps coming back to the writing. So everything just sort of supports each other. That is so lovely, and I think that. 
one of the things people sometimes overlook in our industry are the supportive partners and spouses and families that are saying, mm -hmm. hey, we understand the writing is important and we're going to accommodate it. Yep, absolutely. Totally, totally. And my family is actually doing that exact thing right now. They went to the library and then are going to the park, which is right next to the library. And then they're getting ice cream for lunch, which I'm jealous. I'm not getting ice cream for lunch. And then, you know, and then they're doing some other stuff and then they're going to come back after I'm tired, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think as a writer, that's so important because if you just write and write, you have nothing to write about. And so you need to be out there doing things and living life so you have meaningful things to say. Oh, absolutely. And so I'm trying to, in fact, I think of how much of my career has just been about me, you know, being out in the neighborhood, being out in the community, and just, uh, you know, just imagining how things could be, uh, telling the, the secret histories of uh, the, the city I live in, or just, uh, you know, talk about my, my neighbors and the good work that they're doing. Yeah. 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 I agree. You know, Kat, what you just said reminds me of something. I don't know if either of you are familiar with the coup, with the rap group, but their lead singer, I read an interview with them once. His name is Boots Riley. And they were like, why do you put albums out like every like six or seven years? And he's like, well, I just, I have to stop for a while and go and live life and find something to write about. Yeah. And then I can come back and write a new album. And, and then I have to stop again and then go back out and live my life. Ooh, that's kind of a... So there's some scary implications in there. Uh -huh. but I have like so many projects going on. I'm like, man, yeah, I'm just living life at a breakneck speed, I guess, because <laughs> I feel like I have this constant mine of yeah. stories. It's just going, going, going. Like I'm like, I got so many stories I still have yet to tell that I just want to get out. Well, so. I have a question related to that. How do you figure out which of the many projects calling to you at any one given time, which one do you listen to? So uh, I was once asked this question is like, wh what's the bit of writing advice you give out that you ignore the most? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and for me, that answer is always work on one project at a time. Oh, that's terrible. No. It, oh, no, no, it's absolutely the advice. I, you know, I'm just like, I, I, I give that advice to like very beginning writers. Just like, you got to get the discipline down mm -hmm. beginning, middle end, beginning, middle end. You mm -hmm. got to get that discipline down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I work on probably probably six projects at a time. Yeah. Oh my. Like I literally am on deadline. I have a project. Okay. Technically it was due yesterday, but I talked to them <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it's due, it's due Monday and they know it's coming Monday. And, but I also know that even leading up to this, if, if I get stuck or if I'm just like, Oh, I'm not quite feeling the energy for this project yet. Then I'm like, okay, well, let me go ahead and turn to the secondary project just to, I can move it forward a little yeah. bit until I feel uh, my legs under me you know, to finally push through and do this yeah. project that's due in two days. <laughs> well, I think, I think that's, for me, that's one of the things that is, is sort of key is productive procrastination, right? You know, exactly. instead yeah. of, I can't write that story right now, I'm going to go downstairs and play video games. It's like, well, I'll go out in the backyard and work on a different story. Yes, I, it's a combination of I have other stories I can just turn to and, and move those forward and catching up on things like laundry and dishes. Yeah. Yeah. And so my wife loves writer's block. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but I, I did notice that my final push on this project came after I'd like literally wrapped up a whole nother short story. And then all the dishes in the house were done. All the laundry in the house was done. I'm like, I'm really out of excuses. Let me go ahead <laughs> and get on this other project. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm wondering, like, how do you... What's, what's your key for time management here? You've got so much going on, you know, and then of course, like you mentioned, you've got family and you've got all these other things that you do. How do you decide when to fit in the different projects? Or is it just like my, my deadlines do and now I've got to do this? <laughs> um, it's, it's a bit of a bit of scheduling and a bit of, okay, it's due. Everybody clear, clear the decks. You just got <laughs> to hammer, uh, you know, push my way through and everything. But but even even today, I, I got up this morning. Um, every Saturday morning, I have a standing coffee with one of the elders from the Kepper Institute, and we get together for coffee, and we will uh, either talk about our weeks or talk about what's going on in, in the organization. But most of the time, it's actually our dreaming space mm. where we can talk about uh, you know just different high level things like you know what what is the role of AI in community? Mm -hmm. You know how how would that work? Mm things like that. So I got up, had, had uh, that standing coffee, and then 
So I'm like, okay. And then uh, by the time I got home, everybody's off doing their uh, Saturday morning routine. So everybody's scattered to the winds at the moment because they know I have like this podcast to do. Plus I have the book to be working on. So they're like, all right, well, you have until about three o'clock, get it in. So I know that I'll, I'll be getting all this stuff done until about three o'clock and then they will be re- returning. And then after that, it's a hey, dad has to be present. Oh, nice. Husband has to be present. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll, I'll be present for the, most of the evening. But then I can also, while doing that sort of stuff, I still have to, I write longhand. Mm-hmm. I do all my writing by and editing by longhand. So at some point I do have to type that stuff in. So that's one of the things I, I'm, I'm, I've been given permission that uh, while we're watching TV or movies or something together, I can go ahead and also type stuff in at that point too. <laughs> so, you know, so it's all, it's, 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 it all kind of, it's, it's a machine that's taken a while to evolve, but uh, yeah. but we've finally gotten there. Yeah. I have a question that I have jotted down, which is very important that I ask, because uh, you have, Maurice, a story in an anthology that Jen Brozek and I have coming out this uh, fall, I think, uh, The Reinvented Detective. Uh, it's The Unremembered Paradox, and you co-wrote it with Bethany K. Warner. And I wondered if you would tell us a little about Bethany and why uh, you chose to do the story together. Oh, sure. Actually, Bethany and I have been friends since, I want to say 2008. Nice. She's actually, uh, she was the founder of my local writers group. Oh. And, uh, and so we've been, uh, and that's has been my longest tenure in a writers group without it blowing up or me blowing it up. So <laughs> <laughs> we've had a pretty good run. And then, uh, like a, a few years ago, we just got in our heads of like, we should probably just do something yeah. together because, uh, you know, I don't like, you know, we have this mythology about the the, the, the lonely writer mm-hmm. toiling away in, in the basement all by themselves. And so and, and I've always tried to push against that going, you know what, how can I make this more collaborative? Yeah. How can I, you know, involve my friends in, in part of this process? And, you know, because it's all, because this is all joy for me. Yeah. So it's like, how am I, how can I invite other people into the joy in one way or another? Oh, awesome. And so uh, we, me and Bethany were just like, you know, what we've never done. We've never actually worked on a story together. So uh, so let's work on a story together. And so we wrote the uh, first draft of the story. And then we looked at it and we even sent it through the, uh, our writers group. And we were just like, yeah, so this story is fundamentally broken. <laughs> and we don't know how to fix uh-huh. it. So we're, so we're going to let it sit for a mm-hmm. while. And so then when the opportunity came up for, uh, for, this, uh, for this anthology, then we were just like, wait a second. Let's pull that story back out because now it's been, it's been, now it's been, we've had some time, we've had some time to think about it. And then we were just like, oh, you know how we need to fix a story? It needs to be told from an entirely different yeah. POV character. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so, so we went through and, and did that process and it was good. And so it was good for a lot of different reasons. So one, you, obviously we got to work together. Two, it's that whole process of like, you know, letting some time pass by and then taking that critical eye to, to oh, the yeah. work also. And then three, Bethany had actually, uh, in, in the times from when we first wrote that to when we came back to revisit it, she'd fallen into a writing slump. And, and she just like, you know, re- overthinking her writing and, uh, you know, wh- whether or not, you know, she should even pursue this. And I'm like, no, no, let's return to the joy. Let's return to the joy. Oh, yeah. So, so we, we dove back in and then she, uh, and again, she, you know, it's what, what part of that. And part of the other thing is like, you get to see another writer's mm-hmm. process and mm-hmm. how they do stuff. And she's like, you really just slap stuff at the walls and sees what sticks. I'm like, isn't that fun? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so, awesome. So, yeah, we don't have to overthink this. Let's just let's just have fun. Throw throw ideas at the wall and then see what we have, and then play in the mud. You know, that's, that's all part of the thrill for me. And so, so she got in the mud with me and started flinging stuff around. Also, <laughs> oh, that's so much and so fun. by the time we were done, she was just like, oh man, I'm ready to tackle my tackle my next project. So she was <laughs> off and oh, running so again. Awesome, nice. That's great. Well, it seems like. Uh, one of the places where collaborative storytelling really occurs is often nowadays in games. Mm. And I was curious, is there a particular game that you're playing right now? And I, Alan, I don't mean to cut you off no. if you have <laughs> stuff you want to ask. No, go but... ahead. I want to talk about games too. Okay, good. There's not a game that I'm playing particularly right now only because games will suck me in. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and I'm like, oh, I can't afford I got... So many projects at the moment, like that, are on hard deadlines, and if I distract myself with games, uh, I, uh, oh, I don't know if I'll ever come out. It's like reading anime. My <laughs> students are always trying to get me to read anime, and I'm like, no, no, uh, you're not going to suck me into that trap. Anime is a black hole, and I would never escape it. So no, I'm not. I'm not jumping in. 
Of course, yeah. that yeah. being said, I was out and about in the community a couple weeks ago, and I ran across this game called Black Wall Street. And, uh, and it's kind of a take on Monopoly, except it's set in in, in Tulsa. with, with uh, and So everybody has to go through the business practice yeah. of developing your LLCs and building this this cooperative Black business network, all based on, on Black Wall Street. And so it's part education, because you learn about what, what Black Wall Street meant meant to the history of uh, uh, mm-hmm. black people in this country it's part it's doubly part education because then you uh, it's literally about what are the steps to build a business and so you have to go through the steps of, yeah. of building a business and then it's all a gamified process and so so then we end up playing the game and so it becomes this really good teaching tool this good, good learning tool and i'm just like oh this is a really yeah. uh, interesting yeah. model and so, uh, so I've been kind of carrying that with me. I actually have another couple of gaming consulting projects I, uh, I'm working on here in town. So I'm just like, okay, that's first and foremost in my, in my brain right now. That's fascinating. I, I just saw recently there was a game that came out that will <laughs> help you file your taxes. I uh, read about that. The, yeah. Yeah. It has to, I looked at it and it has to be unfortunately tax form that's simpler than the one that I'm using. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's ah. one of the things we're looking at at, at the at the Kepper Institute. Uh, one reason I, uh, I brought the game to everybody's attention was like, hey, what does it look like to gamify right. some of the community work? And so that's something that, that we've yeah. been thinking about as an organization for a while, too. So this all of a sudden this pops up and I'm just like, OK, let's let's te- tease it apart and figure yeah. out uh, what this means and, and how we can look at the work. That's yeah. fascinating. Super interesting. Yeah, I, that's relates a lot to what I do at my job, actually. We might have to talk after the podcast is over. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, though, like, what, what's... You've, you've worked on games. Kat, and you've worked on games, too. Not as much. I was wondering what the creative process was like for working on a game and how that relates to your writing process. It originally started because I, I go to a convention called Gen Con, which is uh, basically in my backyard, mm-hmm. right? And so oh, it's a nice. largest... Uh, gaming convention and uh originally it was like okay how can i thinking through the business side for example of writing i need multiple income streams and, and, and so there's all this gaming work and gaming possibilities out there so let me start networking it in that arena turns out a lot of that work is with editors who are in other other areas of publishing also so you're built it's literally just building yeah, your, your, your yeah. same overarching network so there's that piece in, in place but then i started applying for uh, some of the writing writing gigs and everything and so uh, the test was always, all right, so you say you want to write for this project. And uh, I think that the first one was uh, was that leverage project. And so they were like, mm-hmm. all right, so uh, if, if you say you're familiar with the, the brand and everything, so here, here's a pitch. We need you to write. And they, they gave me my, my writing assignment. And it was like either 500 or 1,500 words, so some, somewhere in there. And they're like, okay, and we need you to turn this around. You have... 36 hours. Oh, wow. So then I would, you know, tur- turn it around and, and get it in. And then they gave me another one and I turned it around. They're like, okay, so now we, and so, you know, so that's how I got, got started. And then that, that was actually the, probably the biggest help in terms of my, my writing was that whole, you know what? I only have 36 hours. Mm-hmm. I, I can't right? overthink this. Cause at, at the time, I, I think I'd, I think this was during my first novel trilogy, the, the Night's Breaking Court and everything. It was during that trilogy. And I was really, really, but we'll just say, considering all of my words precious and overthinking them and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, uh, no, you ain't got time for all that. And so that, that's probably the biggest thing I've applied is the whole, all right, let's not overthink this. Let's just get in there and, and get the writing done and then see what we have after that. Because everything can be fixed in revision, if nothing else. So uh, let's, let's just not overthink it. Let's just go in and, and just be carried by the the thrill of words and just and story and just get just caught up in it. And just whatever comes to your head, get it out on the page and we'll fix it later. Mm-hmm. And that that was so freeing for me as as a creative, and it's applied almost too much so lately because, like I said, I'm waiting to the last minute and I'm going. going well, I still got it's not, I got till Monday. Oh man, that's still yeah, that's, that's about thirty six hours. I can I probably got some time I can kill in between there <laughs> between now and, and <laughs> when I need to get it done. So, but that the whole discipline of getting it done fast and, and turning it around that is that's been vital to my uh, writing process. That's awesome. Great, great, great. Is there a particular game that you've worked on that you just really, really enjoyed? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the Watch Dogs project. Um, well, oh, man, there's... Okay, so that was one. Also, writing Marvel superheroes, because the first time, actually, I, I, I ended up writing a lot of the Black... Shockingly, I wrote a lot of the Black <laughs> wow, Panther yeah. sections for uh, for that game. But there's the Watch Dogs 2 project. And like I said, my, the way my life is built, everything sort of stacks on each other. 
And I didn't realize how much street cred that that video game was going to give me when it came to managing a classroom. Because wow. this was this was like during my first year of teaching, and so I had a class, and I was out of my depth in this class anyway because it was a technology class. Of uh, I'm teaching middle school students, and me and technology have a we have a complex relationship. I'll just say it that. Way. <laughs> and so this class was starting to they, they, they you know they're middle school students, so they can sense weakness. And so they, they were starting to act right, up. Right. And so they were they were all over the place. And so at one point they were like changing their, their screensavers to uh to Watch Dogs 2 and things like that. Cause that was the that was the big game. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that's Watch Dogs 2. And they're like, oh, what do you know about Watch Dogs 2? And I'm like, well, I was one of the writers on it. And they were like, wait, what now? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, check the credits. I was one of the writers on that project. And then the student was like, everybody be quiet. Mr. Broadus is speaking now. <laughs> And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so that, that game has done done a lot of work for me. <laughs> that's amazing. Right, right. Oh, that's fun. That's so funny. I can relate to that so much. I used to be a teacher, so, yeah. Ah. I get that 100%. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're a pretty funny guy. I met you at Worldcon, and immediately, within, like, five minutes, I'm like, I need to get this guy on the podcast somehow. He is hilarious right. and right. he's doing so much cool stuff. You, you know, how do you convey your sense of humor in your writing? You know, how, how do you make that work? And do you have any tips for folks out there who want mm. to write humorous stuff? Yeah, it, it, it's always project dependent because humor like is like any other tool in the, the writer's toolkit, right? So it's about, you know, how, how can I deploy this and when do I need to deploy this to uh, affect the mood I'm trying to go mm. for in this story? So sometimes it's a matter of, oh, I'm talking about some pretty heavy topics. And so I'm, I'm like thinking of my novel, uh, Pimp My Airship. Mm-hmm. And so uh-huh. in that novel, I mean, I, I'm, I'm dealing with some pretty heavy topics. I'm talking about over-policing, talking about oppressive systems. I'm talking about late-stage capitalism. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you can just tick off topic after topic after topic that I'm addressing in this book, right? Mm-hmm. But if you read the reviews of it, the reviews of it as, wow, that was one of the funnest romps I've ever had. In reading this book, and that's because I was I was very intentionally using humor to diffuse the, the heaviness of the topics that were, that were being talked about, mm-hmm. and that I was doing that very deliberately for a specific effect because I knew some of the territory I was covering, and I'm like I don't want I don't want to lose sight of my first job, which is to entertain the reader. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I say all the time that uh you know I write for me, but I publish to be read, and so. Uh, so my first drafts are always just for me, but in that second, uh, the, you know, as, but if I'm thinking about it for publication, then it's like, all right, so let me, let me, let me do the rest of my job. You know, the first draft is just me venting whatever it is is in me, but now I'm I'm going through with the deliberation of, all right, so let me make sure I can carry the reader along for this ride. You know, no matter where they are, where, where, right. how, how are they coming at this, I want to be able to capture that reader and just take them along on this ride. And I knew with the characters I created for that story, it's like, look here these characters you will follow these characters anywhere they, anywhere they go um mm-hmm. and so and, and but that was with a deliberate use of humor and and, and humor is tricky humor is tricky mm-hmm. so i have a couple of buddies um howard taylor is one jeff strand is another who who really uh humor is just part of their brand and so i, I whenever one of them has a class a panel a seminar anything on 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 infusing your work with humor i'm always tracking them down and and, and, and sitting in on those classes i i do have a reputation for being a funny guy, which makes it really intriguing that most of my career was in horror. And uh, <laughs> people were like, but those stories are so dark and, and you're so funny. I I don't know what to do with that. And I'm like, yeah, I get that all the time. <laughs> it's, it's always about, you know, which, which stories am I going to use that effect in? Right. Well, you pick the projects wisely because there's been plenty of times when I've been writing a horror story and, and I have a great joke for it. And I'm like, and I can't use it because it blows the mood of the scene. Yeah. But then I will just, you know, save that joke. And <laughs> if I have to, I'll write a whole other story around that joke just for an excuse to use that joke. Because I'm like, if it's good, I'm going to keep it and I'm going to use it somewhere. Right. right. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. We had Martha Wells on, I don't know, three episodes ago or four episodes ago or something. And, and she was saying some of the same things you were that. Humor is, humor is pretty tricky to write. You just kind of have to be yourself and hope it conveys. You know what I mean? Right. right. <laughs> well, I think, I think humor also depends on confidence. 
if that makes sense. Uh, you know, just sort of be the, the delivery sometimes is is as funny as mm-hmm. anything else. Well, yeah, because uh, I think about uh, the middle school books uh, for, I have, for example. And again, I'll cover a lot of pretty heavy topics in, in those in those books too. But I also know that yeah, I'm going to lose my middle schoolers quickly if I'm not. Uh, you know, <laughs> thinking like them and doing jokes like them and keep and it, and it has to be pretty rapid fire to hold, hold their attention too. So right. that's always an interesting, uh, <laughs> speaking of revision processes, that's always fraught, uh, a fraught process too. <laughs> so how do you approach a revision? Let's say like, like when you came back to uh, the story that you and Bethany co-wrote, like how did you find your way back into it? Let's see. Actually, I'll back up because I, I learned the lesson of how I did that through a different project. Oh, interesting. Let's hear so, about that. Uh, so it was with uh, my second middle school book, uh, Unfadable. And when I turned in the first draft, or the yeah, first draft, uh, the editor was like, we really like this story, but it's fundamentally broken. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how to tell you how to fix it but fix it. <laughs> I'm like, right. oh, okay. And so what they said, I can't even remember the words they used, but they were like, oh, it's, do a reverse. It's almost like a reverse outline in a lot of ways. And so basically what I ended up doing is uh, I took a bunch of three by five cards. And for each chapter, I, I just wrote out, here, here, are the, here, are the, here are the major scenes. And I, and I just did that for the whole mm-hmm. book. And so I spread it out. And I, I, my favorite part is I actually did this in class. And so all the students are now watching me do this. Now, what are you doing, Ms. Brown? I'm editing a book. And so, so I'm, I'm talking I'm talking through this. So I've laid out all the chapters on, on the ground and, and all, all the and note cards underneath it and, and the storylines uh, represented on each note cards. And just by looking down at and I just take, take like five, ten minutes. I'm just staring at the story, staring at the story. And I'm just like, oh, I see the problem. It, it, it was one. It was one character thread. When the the journey, the when uh, the storyline that maps out the, the the kind of like the secret origin of the main character, it was all tangled up and, and and all balled up in like the first third of the book. And so then I just rearranged those those note cards to spread the story out. So now it becomes a, a running thread right. through the whole book. And so then I so then the editing process was literally just me cutting and pasting the the, the storyline into the right order, and then seeing what I had. And then all of a sudden, the book flowed in a, in a totally different way. And so when I when I turned that back in, they were like, "And this is it, this is it." And so it's that process of, "All right, let's just break the story down, and and see what sort of pieces we're working with, and uh, and then see how how is the story reading to us." And so when we did that process, then it's just like, "Yeah, you know what? There's a certain detachment we have with the story because." Oh, it's because we're telling it from the wrong point of view. It's this this character who we'd introduced as a periphery character. That's actually the main character of this story. That's who the story should be told through. Right. And so then it's just like, all right, so who's going to do the first pass on rewriting it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so once it got diagnosed, someone has to do that first pass. It's like, all that's right. That's it. So it's going, not me. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So I was like, all right, I, I, I'll, I'll try. I'll do the first pass. So I did that. Then she left back in. And so we go back and forth. Um, but, yeah, so it's always that diagnosing of, of that that problem. In fact, speaking of unfatable, the in the in, in, leading up to part of that that major revision, I had turned it over to uh, uh, you know, cause I'd like to do as much of my work in front of my students as possible, so they can just see, especially the right. whole idea of revision, you know, because middle schoolers like mm-hmm. you're good to get that first draft out of them, yeah. much less trying to convince them that they need to do like three drafts of something. And that's, yeah. Mr. Brown, is that right. we don't get an extra grade for all that extra work? Like, no, literally, that's part <laughs> of the assignment. It really is part of the work. And so, uh, but. I have this sta- I have this manuscript in front of me, and I, one of my students, and she is this vor- voracious reader, voracious reader, and she's like, "Mr. Brown, that's your book, isn't it?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And she's like, "Hey, how about if I take it home and I'll I'll read it and, and I'll give you my notes?" And I'm like, "Real okay, you know what? Take it, take the book, and give me your notes." All right. The next day, she's back in my classroom, <laughs> and she just comes strutting into the classroom, and she's got this big grin on her face. And I'm like, all right, what's up? She goes, Mr. Broadus, I circled all the boring parts for you. <laughs> and I start open, I start flipping through this manuscript, and I've never had a manuscript bleed so much red before. Oh my god! And so awesome. I'm just like, oh, 
Okay. But, you know, I went through, I fixed all the boring parts. I got it all, the story in the right order. And uh, and I credited her actually in the book as one of my uh, official editors for, for the project. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. And it also, it actually, there was another uh, lesson in my, for my writing in that also, which is, you know what, people get scared of reviews for, you know, once your book's out there. Uh-huh. But if you've ever been reviewed by a middle schooler, <laughs> oh, you, you developed Teflon skin after that. <laughs> wow. Man. Yes. Yes, that is uh, that lovely. is so true. Absolutely, hundred percent true. I love that. So, have any of your students tried to pass off chat <laughs> GPT works yet? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let me. T- <clears throat> okay, <laughs> I will tell the story. This uh, the student gets sent sent down to me with with uh, and his and his teacher sends me this note said, hey, we, we ran, the, ran the, 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 the essay through the program. Turns out it's 71% plagiarized. And so can you work with him? I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll work with him. And so he sits down across from me and he's like, Mr. Broadus, I don't understand why I'm being penalized for using the tools at my disposal in order to get this work done. Fair enough. Right. And I'm just like, yeah, that I get that. In fact, frankly, I encourage that. However, the most important thing that we bring to writing is your unique voice. So how do we get your unique voice, your unique take on, on this project? And then he's like, yeah, I have no voice on this project because I have no interest in this project. I'm like, okay. Uh, All right. I get that also. Cause sometimes we have to do work. We aren't always interested in. So let's, so a, let's start try and find a way to, uh, you know, find your way into your areas of interest in, in light of this project. So we, we did that work. And then let's try to, you know, not say copy and paste Wikipedia to make your points. <laughs> We're try, try, try these two, two processes down. So we, we work and work. We, we only had the, the, an hour together. And so by the time we finished the first hour, we, we, we check everything. And he's just like, ah, 21% plagiarized. Mr. Brothers, we're good. And I'm like, no, no, no. no. We're, we're, we're not quite there yet because we want to get, you know, 0% plagiarized. Zero. <laughs> but, yeah. but we are making progress. That's awesome. Well, I I had to wonder because it just seemed to me that popped up and it spread so freaking mm-hmm. fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and it's keeping everybody on their toes. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean... But what, the other thing I remind them is like this, you are correct. It is a tool at your disposal, but the tool is only as good as its user. And so you have to know what yeah. it is you're inputting in order to get the, the, the proper things out right. of it, which is interesting. Right. I, oh, yeah. I, I was just thinking, can I tell the story? But I'm like, ah, the school administration won't hear this. So I should be good. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like even as teachers, you know, we have to do our, our year end reflections and, and things like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll do this other one instead. This way, no one gets in trouble. So the art teacher came into the room, and he's he's uh, and he he and I are really good buddies and everything. And so, and we have these careers in art outside of the school, and so we're always you know comparing notes. And so he's writing uh try, writing this grant uh doing this grant application, uh, and so he just like he goes through and he keeps inputting these prompts into Chat GTP, and so Chat GTP uh, GTP ends up writing the first draft of this grant proposal for him. And he's like, uh-huh. all right, so this reads, actually, he, he, he makes his notes on it. He, he knows he has to cut certain things because it's just obviously not true, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like, hey, can you take a look at this and give me your notes uh, on it? And I'm like, oh, man, I'm so tight on this one, on this deadline. I, I just don't have time to do it. And he goes, oh, okay, that's fine. And so he tells Jet, Chat GTP, all right, so you are now Maurice Broadus. Oh, God. Critique, my, uh, critique this grant proposal through uh, the lens of Maurice Broadus and, and those he would give. And so it spits out all these notes in my voice. Oh, my gosh. Oh, fabulous. Uh, and so and I, and I, he go, and he shows me the notes because now I'm fascinated because I'm hearing him do all those prompts out loud and everything. And yeah. so I'm like, wait, yeah. so what did it say? So he shows it to me. I'm like, yeah, this does sound like what I would say, all right. And so, th- so yeah. then he has yeah. chat GP. He goes, adjust my grant in light of the criticisms by Maurice Broadus. Right. And so, so then does all this. And so there's another, another teacher had wandered into the room and, is in, and he's hearing us do all this. And he's just like, Hey, can you have it do my notes for me? And then he's like, No, he can't. Uh, it can't because you don't have enough of a footprint out there for, for it to be able to there scrape and, and put together, you know, the kind of notes necessary. And so I'm just, I'm watching this whole process with just utter fascination going, Ooh, we are uh-huh. in some times right now. Yeah. Ooh, and we got to be on it. We have to be, uh, uh, I, I'm always encouraging people. It's like, 
it's now's not the time to despair. Now's the time to double down and be creative no. and to uh, and be on our uh, yeah. and to be on our toes and just be at yeah. the forefront of of learning this tool, learning what's out there, and then always trying to stay ahead. Because in the end, you know, like I said, yeah. back, coming down to what is our voice? What is our voice? Because that's ultimately yeah. our, our main contribution yeah. to you know the library of letters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're already getting low on time, believe it or not. <laughs> There's a few questions I wanted to ask you about community, which is obviously very important to you between the Kepper Institute, being a teacher, and even in your book, Sleep of Stars, I mean, you know, the community, right, is, mm-hmm. is like a whole culture, right? Right. Can you, can you talk about the importance of community to you and how you got involved in community organizing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it started, actually, it literally started with Pip Meyership. Because the main thesis of Pitt Meyership, I was at a crossroads point in my life, and I'm like, I'm I'm just a writer, but I want to have impact on uh, on my community. I want to have impact mm-hmm. on the city and the world around me, but I, but I'm just a writer, and so I, I don't know what it looks like for you know to use art to make any sort of like real world change, and so mm-hmm. that becomes the thesis of of the book, which is a, when the main character is his name is Sleepy, he's an open mic poet. And he is perfectly comfortable with his place and role in life. He's basically a cog in the machine, but he's found his comfortable spot, and so he's just living his life. And then he gets dragged into the cause, you know, the, the battle for civil rights and liberties. He, he gets dragged into this this struggle, kicking and screaming all, all the way through, with the whole idea of like, you know, what the what the what the the cause needs. It needs your voice. So that becomes like this uh, this process. I'm, I'm you know, and I'm literally just thinking through this whole process through through the lens of, of writing. And then I end up joining a, a community organization here in town called called the Learning Tree. And so with the the Learning Tree, you know, I'm, I'm going around and, uh, and 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 listening to to my neighbors, fi- finding out the stories of my neighbors, and and reimagining my neighbors in terms of well, here here are the gifts and the skills that you bring to community that you may not even realize you bring to community. So I'm I'm like writing all these profiles of neighbors with their gifts and talents and everything. In fact, one one critical moment was I'm. I'm uh, I, I listened to this group of, uh, you know, these. some of them are, are uh, uh, had just come out of prison. Some of them were, were, you know, still dealing drugs or in gangs and, you know, but it's like, no, 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 all of you are gifts to community. And so, so I, I've written out these profiles for each of them and I'm handing them their profiles and I'm, and then it occurs to me, I have just handed out these profiles to these very large, hard bitten men <laughs> and I don't know how they're going to receive it. And so, like, there's this pause, and then they start handing their cards to, well, these sheets of paper to each other, and going, "Is this who I am? Is this how I'm seen?" And da 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 da. And, and so they're seeing themselves reflected, and, they're, and then they're, and their friends are like, "No, no, this is you. These are the gifts and talents that you, that you have." And so now it's like, "All right, so you are aware of these gifts and talents. Now, how do we leverage those gifts and talents for you to be a benefit to community? So we get to have those discussions also, and we get to organize through that lens." So, so that's how it started. And then I know, then I realized that, you know, I'm starting, this is starting to impact my writing. So I'm starting to write, you know, the, some of these folks reimagined as, you know, with powers or with magic or with these other, other elements, and, you know, and all of a sudden I, uh, uh, my writing t- takes a bit of a turn on top of that. So now, so, so now we've gone from my airship to my, my short stories have been impacted. And so now I'm sitting around and, and I've uh, found my way to the uh, Kepler Institute and I'm like, oh, what are we working towards? What's the kind of world that we would love to create? And so I basically spend a year just sort of thinking through that and thinking through, you know, I, if we have a blank page and we get to create on our terms, you know, what does the education system look like? What does the economic system look like? What's the role of, of art and technology in this world? What's the, what's the power of story when it comes to policing? And what's the role of AI and community? And this is actually how the coffees with uh, the elders started because we would just get together on Saturday mornings, just dream about possibilities. Mm-hmm. And so, so now you see this process of like the work inspiring me. And then I start create stories and the stories impacts the work. And then that work then comes back to impact me. So we begin to create this sort of a uh, continuing circle of uh, the impact of story and community on, on each other. Yeah, I love that. And I would highly recommend to our listeners to check out Sleep of Stars because you really do an interesting job of reimagining government, which is something that I get on a soapbox about a lot is, is how science fiction is just is dead in the imagination when it comes to government. You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. oh, let's go back to, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to have these interplanetary kingdoms. But like, why? Why? <laughs> right. Emperors. 
the Galactic Emperor. I, you know what? I think that goes back to Flash Gordon. <laughs> I think that Ming the Merciless sees the imagination, and then we just ran <laughs> with it for some <laughs> reason. I don't know, but it drives well, me crazy. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been I've been called to the principal's office on occasion because of my stories for exactly that reason. So <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. That is funny. Yeah, apparently it's uh you know you if you are doing an, an ongoing critique of the systems you see around you, some of those uh, systems are like, wait a second. Uh, yeah, are it's you talking back. about us? Yeah. Uh, are you are we the bad guys in this situation? You're like, well, <laughs> oh god, <laughs> oh my. Well, that's always mortifying to realize uh, in some situation you're the bad guy or you're the, you know, perceived as, you know, and that they'd often the other person has a perfectly right. valid. Stance. Well, I mean, when I, because uh, this was the, with a city official that I ended up having this conversation with, and I said, well, actually, that should be the question that we should always be asking ourselves. Like, am I the bad guy? Am I the bad yeah. guy? Because it's so easy to get caught up. I mean, because the system is the system. Yes. And so you can be off doing yes. what you see is perfectly fine work. And it probably is perfectly good work. But it's still a part of the system, mm-hmm. and the system, the greater right. its greater job is to carry out itself. And so your good work is still being co-opted by the system to per- perpetuate a bad mm-hmm. outcome. So you, we always have to be in that space of like, am I the bad guy? Am I, you know, where, where am yeah. I in this process? Yeah. So I just got to say, this has been such a good <laughs> interview. I, I'm going away. I mean, I just this has been delightful. We could we could go for like three hours. I think totally. Okay, so we have a couple questions that we ask everybody that comes on, Maurice. Okay. Before we get to the last two questions, I just want to ask you, like, can you can you recommend ways to our listeners to get involved in their communities? Ooh. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, I, I look even at my uh, – with my wife who was th- – this is not her bag of tea at all. I mean, and not even, not even a little bit. And so – uh, and my mother, because my mother lives with us now too. So you know, this is to- the, the work I do is just so totally different to what they they're used to. So it's like you know, we can always just start small. Like, do you even uh-huh. do you even know your neighbor? You know, who lives on either side of you? Who lives across the street from you? Do yeah. you even know them? Mm-hmm. And and just asking that question alone. It's like really just transfigured my wife in a whole lot of uh, she because she made it a, her point. Like, let me get to know my neighbors. And she did. And so now she just by simply continued just just having conversations with the people around her. She's now become the neighborhood hub. Mm-hmm. So when something goes wrong in the neighborhood, they're all like, hey, Sally, da, 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 da. They're, they're, they're always the first call. In fact, I'm I, sometimes I'm like, because <laughs> uh, we were up last night and I'm like, I, I thought we were just watching TV, but she suddenly gets on the security camera and starts rolling through tape and stuff. I'm like, what's going on? She goes, well, a neighbor just alerted me to da, 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 and I need to find out what happened. I'm like, okay, Batman, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's awesome. So, uh, so there's that. Another, another way. Um, actually, I literally outline it. That's literally the, the the plot of Unfatable, my second middle grade book. Huh. Nice. And it's about a, a young lady, and she just wants to try and figure out money, uh, how to get money to do a little arts project in the neighborhood. And so she finds out where, where, what, what's the neighborhood meeting? She talks to some folks, finds out where, if if the if there are neighborhood meetings, and there are always neighborhood meetings. And so she starts to attend those, and she slowly starts to get involved. Now, granted, she's a middle schooler, so her motivation for getting involved <laughs> is through the lens of self interest. We'll just put it that way. Sure. Yeah. And pettiness, because some people piss her off at some point, and so she's like, uh, uh-uh, uh, uh-uh. now it's you know. So <laughs> there's that. But the whole thing is about. One, getting involved. How do you get involved? And how do you have agency through the whole process? Because, you know, the, you, the, it is you up against the system. Right. But you have to navigate that. Uh, you have to figure out how to navigate that through that lens of agency and not feeling trapped and defeated uh, as a system is designed to make you feel. And then how do you persevere through all that? And so that's, that literally is the, the plot of uh, Unfatable. Fantastic. Nice. Okay. So what is bringing you hope right now? Ooh, what is bringing me hope, man? <laughs> so, I just finished week one. I, I I've just uh, I, I brought back my creative writing club. Oh. I don't. I'd only done it once before. Uh, I did it my, during my first year as a teacher, and then time had gotten away from me. And I'm just like, you know what? T- if if that's going to be my excuse, time will always get away from me. So let me bring this back. And while that sounds noble, that isn't actually the whole complete story. The rest of the story is that I have an eighth grade student who wrote and published her first book when she was 12. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Cause she just came to my classroom and slapped it on my desk. I'm like, Mr. Broadus, I need your help. Where do I go from here? 
Oh, and I'm just like, okay, well, let's figure it out. So I brought back the uh, Creative Writing Club, and it's filled with all these young ladies that are so delightful. I don't have time to even go into the cast of characters that I'm now working with, but they are absolutely, when one described, because uh, the first exercise is always about voice and like, who are you? And how do you bring th- that worldview that you have to your stories? Because I told them from the beginning, right now, I'm not Mr. Broadus, I'm Maurice Broadus which means I'm going to treat you like my writing peers. So I'm going to talk to you like my writing peers. So let's go. <laughs> and so, uh, so when I asked them how they did, would describe themselves, and when one young lady says, I'm the living embodiment of a Discord chat room. <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. Class is dismissed because it's not getting much better than <laughs> yeah, that kind of a description. Yeah. And so working with them, I mean, that gives me hope. It gives me hope for the future. It gives me hope for the next generation of writers. So it's like, hey, whatever, hey, whatever I got, whatever name I got, reputation I got, whatever social capital I got is now yours. How how do, how can I use that to, to help support you all? Because y'all, yeah. y'all are going to take over the world. So how can I help y'all do that? Yeah, I love it. I love it. And very last question you know, what projects do you have coming up, if you can name them all, and <laughs> where can we find you on the internet? Well, on the internet, it's easy, because it's all MauriceBroadus.com, MauriceBroadus, well, actually, that's pretty much it, Twitter, Facebook, all, all the all the socials, Instagram, even though, oh, yeah, Instagram, technically TikTok, although I've been preemptively banned from actually doing any TikTok <laughs> by my agent and my students, and frankly, my family. They were like, you know, we don't need you out there <laughs> doing anything, because we are, I demonstrated what my first video was going to be, and they're like, and you're done now. <laughs> So they, they cut me off from TikTok pretty early, but all the socials, you can find me that way. Projects I'm working on. Well, it was just announced that I am, uh, so the project that is due Monday is literally all the revisions for this Black Panther book that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. That's probably the big project going on. But as was pointed out, I, it's like, I have, I think all told, I have four novels to get out the door this year. I th- the, the plan is four novels and six more short stories to get out the door this year. Wow. So that's that's what's keeping me busy. The the, the big two, uh, so the, the ones I can talk about would be the Black Panther book and then the sequel to Sweep of Stars, which is going to be called Breath of Oblivion. Yeah. And so uh, so those are the two I, I can talk about, definitely. Yeah, there's definitely some other things percolating that I can't wait to announce. Awesome. Looking forward to Breath of Oblivion, I have to say. Sweep of Stars was, was quite awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. My pleasure. Absolutely. <laughs> And we are back. Before we go on, I'd just like to talk real quick about how you can possibly support us. As we always say, the best thing that you could do is to share us with your friends on Facebook or Twitter or Mastodon or wherever it is that you're using social media these days. If you'd like to support us even more than that, check us out on patreon.com slash if this goes on. We'd really appreciate it if you're able to contribute. And um, we have multiple tiers that you can choose from. Go out, check that out. We also have coffee. So that's K-O-F-I. If you go out to coffee, you can give us a one-time donation there as well, which we would also equally appreciate. So now that all of that is done, I want to remind you that at the top of the episode, we said that we are really crushed for time in this particular interview. So Kat has already gone about her day, and so I'm here to take us out of the episode I just wanted to mention really quickly one takeaway that I'd like to briefly discuss, and that is just about how to become part of your community. You know, I love Maurice's answer. He just makes it sound so easy and um, something really that all of us could do to make our neighborhoods better. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the interview. I highly recommend you check out Sweep of Stars if you haven't already. It is not the easiest read, but it is quite an interesting one. Thanks to everyone for supporting us, and we'll talk to you all next time. We're keeping hope alive, one episode at a time. If This Goes On, Don't Panic is edited by Alan Bailey and produced by Ken Schrader. Our theme music is by Father Flamethrower. Additional music is by Christopher Snydrosky and outro music by Sable Aradia. Intro by Dave Robison. A special thanks to our guest, Maurice Broadus. Thanks for supporting us, and we'll see you again soon.